And good evening, everyone. As I've been said hello to already, I'm deeply embarrassed about doing this presentation because there's at least a dozen people in the room who could do it much better than me. And I'm particularly aware that Sheila, sitting on my left, who was my boss when I was in Malawi for three years, and I can honestly say taught me all I knew at that stage. And things that you mentioned, Sheila, particularly the SAJ putting policy to practice note that you wrote, I think still holds true to this day. She said something given that was about 10 years ago. Um, so I'm sure um, you'll pick me up when I go wrong, and I'm looking forward to the de debate afterwards. As Peter says, what I think all I'm going to do is raise some issues. I'm going to ask myself some rhetorical questions and then answer them in the hope that I sort of you can phrase the debate that happens after about 30 minutes or thereabouts. I should just say, really, two government health warnings, or the non-government health warnings. Um, the first is that, uh, although I worked for DFID for 10 years on various different forms of contract, I'm now an independent consultant. And I would like to think that I, I learned something whilst working for DFID, but the views I'm espousing are definitely mine, don't represent HMG or any of the clients that I worked for recently. Uh, and the second thing is that I've deliberately chosen not to use PowerPoint. And I am so bored with PowerPoint, I can't tell you. So I hope you can live without it for the next 30 minutes. Um, most of the work I've done, and I, the reason I, I mention this is, is it, it probably explains the flavor of the way I'm going to do the debate, has been around the point where policy meets practice leading teams or designing uh, missions or doing evaluations at that policy practice juncture, which is quite an uh, Good evening, everyone. As I've been said hello to already, I'm deeply embarrassed about doing this presentation because there's at least a dozen people in the room who do it much better than me. And I'm particularly aware that Sheila, sitting on my left, who was my boss when I was in Malawi for three years, and I can honestly say taught me all I knew at that stage. And things that you mentioned, Sheila, particularly the SAJ putting policy to practice note that you wrote, I think still holds true to this day. She said something given that was about 10 years ago. Um, so I'm sure um, you'll pick me up when I go wrong, and I'm looking forward to the de debate afterwards. As Peter says, what I think all I'm going to do is raise some issues. I'm going to ask myself some rhetorical questions and then answer them in the hope that I sort of you can phrase the debate that happens after about 30 minutes or thereabouts. I should just say, really, two government health warnings, or the non-government health warnings. Um, the first is that, uh, although I worked for DFID for 10 years on various different forms of contract, I'm now an independent consultant. And I would like to think that I, I learned something whilst so working for DFID, but the views I'm espousing are definitely mine, and don't represent HMG or any of the clients that I worked for recently. Uh, and the second thing is that I've deliberately chosen not to use PowerPoint. And I am so bored with PowerPoint, I can't tell you. So I hope you can live without it for the next 30 minutes. Um, most of the work I've done, and I, the reason I, I mention this is, is it, it probably explains the flavor of the way I'm going to do the debate, has been around the point where policy meets practice, leading teams or designing uh, missions or doing evaluations at that policy practice juncture which is quite an interesting position to be. And that really will give the flavor of what I'm going to suggest. I'm not coming at this from an academic perspective, nor probably from a pure practitioner perspective, somewhere between the two. And clearly, I'm only going to have a view when I mention country programs from those which I've seen at first hand, either because I've been working in them, or because I've reviewed them. And over the last four or five years, the majority of the work I've done has either been reviewing programs or, or designing new ones, which again would explain perhaps a slight um, perspective I come from, and therefore the majority of what I'm going to be raising, you know, our discussions can be much broader, will be sub-Saharan Africa based, um, simply those of the countries I'm going to choose from. Um, so I want to set the scene uh, and encourage you then to have the debate uh, on an open, open nature. So I think I'm going to ask myself about seven questions, and I said then try and answer some of them. And that I, if you want to jump in, by the way, and, and have a burning comment and want to make straight away, rather than holding for Q&A, that's absolutely fine with me if it's okay with the QR. So I suppose the first and obvious question is, why is oversight and accountability within the security and justice sector important? And I think before answering that question, we have to go back two steps. The first is, I suppose, we would say that accountability and oversight of all institutions, all organisations is important, particularly if they're in the public purse, in the public sector. And, it, and, and if you're working in health, education and welfare sector, accountability and oversight is terribly important. But it does strike me that if you're working in the security and justice sector, that oversight and accountability becomes more important, simply because of the wide-ranging legal powers that the various institutions have within security and justice. Uh, and this is all fairly straightforward stuff, but if you work in the police service anywhere in the world, you have the power to stop, to detain, to search, 
to use legitimate force, to use legitimate lethal force under certain exceptional circumstances. Equally, if you're working with the judiciary, you can, have, you can confiscate goods from people, you can detain people, you can sentence them, and give various forms of legal sanction. The prison service, you detain people against their will, and you restrict their movement. Military militias clearly now also have the right to use force. I think the police are always an interesting and a prime example uh, of why accountability and oversight is so important because the two unique powers they have and operate in parallel with, the first being discretion, whether or not to interact, which I think is probably a common sense view of policing, and secondly, whether or not force is required. Now, if you put discretion together with the ability, legitimate ability to use force, perhaps we can see why accountability and oversight is terribly important. Um, it's also important for some headline reasons, isn't it? It's important that there's a compliance with the rule of law wherever we're operating. It's important that human rights norms uh, are upheld. It's important to create public confidence in the provision of whatever service the in institution is delivering. And it demonstrates, hopefully at least, that uh, the priorities and policies that particular institution is supposed to be delivering are in fact being met. And finally, and rather unusually, it also protects those institutions from unwarranted complaints that they are unable to demonstrate that the right systems and processes have been followed. I think if that's the generic and worldwide picture, if we then drop down to what we're supposed to be talking about, which is security and justice development programs, it becomes even more important for probably quite clear and obvious reasons. The first one is that I think <coughs> normally when you look at security and justice program, they will vary, and I'm talking generically clearly, they will say somewhere in there that they're aiming to reform, I don't like that word at all, maybe professionalise or develop or modernise would be better words, an institution, they're going to enhance it so it can more properly uh, deliver services for people particularly vulnerable. And often programme high level ambition stops at that point and it doesn't talk about accountability and oversight, it might be a lesser order issue. I think the dangers are obvious that if you work with institutions that have the ability to use force, that are closely connected to political power, and how particularly in the past, in conflict or post-conflict states, abused individuals, then making sure that your program at the same time as professionalising that institution also has the ability to put in place accountability and oversight structures is absolutely important. I think I would stick my neck out and say no professionalisation without accountability and oversight. The two go together. I'm going to come back to this later on because I think it's important. Uh, too often I think you see one without the other, or the other, i.e. accountability and oversight seems to be a lesser order issue, which is thought about at the last moment. The, the second point I think is important in security and justice programming is nothing to do with behaviour, because often when we talk about accountability, people default to it being all about making sure that corporate and individual behaviour is correct, that the rules are being followed and there are no human rights abuses falling out of that. But it's also important in terms of setting performance, doing the right thing at the right time with the right people. And if you're going to have a performance framework and be held to account for your performance, then someone has to set the performance targets in the first instance. What you're doing has to be able to be recorded and someone has to set the high level policy which says the priorities we wish you to follow are these, and the way that you're going to be remunerated is this. Your budget will look like this, and individuals will be held to account if these measures aren't met. And that can't be the institution itself, which all too often it is. It should be a high-level order, so if we stick with policing, it might be a Ministry of Home Affairs, a Ministry of Internal Affairs, a higher-level institution. Um, and finally, particularly for the donor, and there will be a donor if you have a, a development program. There's also an issue of mitigation of risk if you're working with a, a, a range of oversight and accountability institutions or processes. Uh, there's more likelihood of you being able to withstand um, the, the criticism that comes when things go wrong, as they always do, if you, at the same time you put into some process of oversight and accountability. So I think the overall need for it, it speaks for itself, and I doubt there would be very great debate about it. Um, the, lack of, um, the lack of meaningful oversight and accountability in many of the programmes that I've either reviewed or looked at in some other respect is quite glaring, I'm afraid. Uh, things are changing, and I'll come on more to this in a moment. I mean, clearly there are exceptions to every rule. Some of the people representing programmes around the table here, I might not update you on to flesh out a little bit of what's happening in those country programmes, 
uh, will have a view on that. But I think historically things have could have been done better. And that's something I'll comment on when I talk about it very briefly about some of the country programs. Uh, the next question I might ask myself is accountability for what? Well, I reiterate the point, we're not just talking about corporate and individual behavior, we're also talking about performance. And again, if you're going to measure performance, if you're going to hold people to account performance, there have to be a whole number of, in, whole number of things that have to be in place. There has to be some transparency about what people are trying to do. There has to be a clear direction of travel with, 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 with indicators on whether progress is being made or not. And an absolute understanding whether, whether progress is positive or not, that this information is going to be passed to the public. Uh, public information is, is fairly critical, I think. And one of the issues that I'm continually disappointed in, and it's, it seems to be the same page or two I write from country to country, is that if you believe, believe the business, strict or business model, which is you have policy at the highest level, setting out what it is you're going to do, strategy, which is how you're going to achieve your policy aims, and then the activities thereunder, that as that the international community keep funding activities in the center of that, i.e. at the strategic level as opposed to the policy level. So time and time again, you'll see a program, again, there's ex exceptions which I'll talk about in a moment, where the police themselves are being encouraged to design strategies to have their own performance standards without any recourse to a higher level ministry or any external consultation. I think that's probably wrong. So I'd like to remember that policy strategy activity debate because I think that, comes, that becomes important when we think about who the key players are. My next question to myself, it's actually quite fun asking yourself questions because you know you always come up with the right answer, um, is accountable to whom? Uh, well, I might start that, actually, and I hope this isn't controversial, by saying who not to be accountable to. Uh, I feel that there's been a growing tendency, particularly in conflict, post-conflict and stabilisation programmes, for the international community themselves to be the institution that says we're going to hold people to account. We are the oversight body. Now, there may be reasons for this, and as much that whichever country you're in, the government has collapsed and there is nothing left there. But it seems an unusual set of circumstances when the institutions of that particular country, working on security and justice, feel that they are actually accountable, other than in, in program terms, to the international community. And I think that's unfortunate. It was certainly something I saw in Iraq, and much more so in Afghanistan. I wonder, in fact, whether it was something to do with the fact that rather than working on professionalizing people's delivery of service, we were often professionalizing their operational outputs, which were closely aligned, perhaps, in our case, the UK government's outputs. But it's something I'm, going to, again, going to come back to, because I think it's important. So instead of being accountable to international communities, what's really important, I think, is that there's a multiplicity of accountability. There's no particular one. And I think clearly there should be, that there is, but isn't always, and often isn't, a line of accountability to government itself in all its different forms. So whether it be to the relevant line ministry, to the Human Rights Commission, to the Office of Ombudsman, to Parliament, uh, or, or, or to whomever, to the legislative framework, that clearly needs to be in place. Often none of those things are in place, or more often they are in place, but they're not working. The structures are there, but they're simply hollow. So at the same time, it's probably, not probably, it's absolutely important that some localised accountability structures in place as well. And those may be as simple as local deliverers of service. I'm going to stick with the police again because they are the easiest example to, to imagine. And local communities sitting together at the point of delivery, discussing what is relevant, what is worrying them, jointly coming up with plans about what to do about this, and then re-meeting some months later to see whether in fact anything's been done and whether things have improved. And that's a, a low-level means of holding, in this instance, the police to account, seeing whether they've listened to you carefully and whether they've done anything about it. And that's a, a really powerful tool. You add the two together, of course, and you're beginning to form a, a stronger a stronger picture. I don't want to delve too much, because um, I'm watching the clock very carefully, I don't want to delve too much into the different models uh, of accountability, because you can read them all, and I bet all of you have done that already. But we can talk about horizontal and vertical accountability. This was an examination she has set me in exactly 2001. Um, horizontal accountability, which I remind you is that conducted, if you like, by other state institutions of the state. So classically, the ministry over the police, the prison service, judicial council over the judici judiciary, etc. Um, strong on legitimacy, 
um, people recognise it and accept it should be done. The weaknesses, of course, are that if you've got weak capacity and weak performance in whatever the institution is you're working with, it's likely that the similar weak capacity and performance in all the other uh, ministries of state or, or organisations and institutions of state. And, of course, they can be subject to political partiality uh, and lack of transparency, as often is the case. Uh, vertical accountability, I remind you again, is really that driven by the people. It could be individual communities, it could be pressure groups, NGOs, CSOs, whatever. But it very much deals with, uh, it's an anti-supply-led uh, form of programming, if you like. You know, local people saying, this is what we want done, and then holding local players to account. Um, there's a thing called diagonal uh, um, accountability, which is strange enough as a mixture of the two. Um, and then, of course, there's a whole issue of internal accountability, which I think we sniff at a bit too quickly sometimes. And there are huge problems with internal accountability in terms of external transparency and people believing it can work. Uh, there's a lot of academic research which suggests that the peer pressure within uh, internal accountability activities can be quite strong because the structures have to be there and they have to be working and they have to be allowed to work. And they require transparency for trust to be developed. Um, a combination of all of those is probably the best way forward. Strangely enough, it's called the 3 plus 1 model, for reasons which should be quite clear. Um, so you have uh, representatives of the democ democratically elected people at whatever level you're operating at, state, province, district, whatever, an independent judiciary, and that can be both a plus and a minus in terms of accountability, because you can play, the judiciary can play the independence card very hard. Uh, a responsible executive, the ministries, the government agencies, and of course, most importantly, I think it's most importantly, those that grassroots holding to account. I reiterate, perhaps for the second time, that having the right framework in place doesn't mean to say that you have any form of accountability and oversight at all. Uh, Janine and I were together briefly earlier this afternoon, and we had a discussion about one particular country which has a very fine looking um, accountability and oversight framework, I won't name it, but actually nothing happens at all really. But it's held up as a model, quite often by academics, as being a really sound way forward. But in fact, there's nothing there at all. It's an empty shell. So it's more than just building a structure. It's making sure you do something with it. In terms of program prioritization and timing, I fear, and again, there are exceptions which immediately come to mind, and we'll touch on something in a minute, I fear that, by and large, oversight and accountability seems to be tagged on at the end of a whole list of things that security and justice programs are supposed to achieve. And I think that's really, really unfortunate. Um, I spend a lot of my time reviewing programs, and it's quite useful to read uh, the reports or the business case or what the program is really about before looking at the program itself. Uh, and it's quite illuminating. So you might find a report which goes on for pages and pages, 20 odd pages, describing the service delivery element, it could be the police or the judiciary or the prison service or the military. And then tagged on at the end of the report will be about half a page on the ministry or whatever. And it sort of suggests to me what the priorities of that writer were. They've gone straight in and looked at the strategic level without looking at the higher level policy framework and policy mandate. And that nearly always uh, turns out to be the way that the program is designed. Now again, there are exceptions to that, but I think, I think that's uh, unfortunate. In terms of the way that security and justice programs over the decade um, or over the last 15 years, perhaps, have approached oversight and, and, and accountability. And I, and I mention this because I've been either implementing programs or reviewing them over that time. I think there's been a change. I, my overall view, and it's not scientific and it might not be correct, is there's been a cyclical movement to do with oversight and accountability, from good to poor to getting better. And I don't know why that is. I think if you go back to the late 90s, early 2000s, I refuse to use the term noughties, um, when you had the big SSAJ, Safety, Security, and Access to Justice programs, accountability was right at the centre of all of those programs, both in terms of low-level accountability and the high-level state accountability. It was absolutely mandated that that's what we did, together with a lot of other things as well. But something I think changed during the first seven years or so of, of, of this particular century, say 2000, 2007, 7 and 8, as a, as an approximation of timing, when I think we dealt more with professionalizing uh, individual delivery institutions than holding them to account in the same program. Why that is, I do not know. Uh, it has been suggested to me it's to do with the SSR agenda, never a policy in the UK, only an agenda, but I sat in the UK's SSR unit and I don't know that that's necessarily right, 
It's been suggested it's because that our attention in the main is drawn to countries in conflict or immediately post-conflict or where heavy stabilization influencing was done and, and, and uh, ensuring that security was laid down on the ground and the operational security was, and state security particularly, but manifested itself, diminished the oversight accountability emphasis. I don't know if any of that's correct, but it's a feeling I have and something I'd really quite like to debate to see whether you feel similarly about it. The good news is, though, I think of late, over the last four or five years, the newer programmes, the programmes which have been designed, say, and I make this data up from the top of my head, about 2010, are much, much stronger on oversight and accountability. And for once, it seems to be vying for attention with the professionalisation. And you know, with professionalisation comes training and equipment, etc., etc. We can have that debate if we want, but it may be better done in a different venue. So I think that this current evidence suggests that, 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 that the newer programmes are much more serious about oversight accountability and have racked it into all of their activities. Um, I've got about five or ten minutes left. I just want to touch on a few country programmes, if I may. And I'm conscious, looking around here, that a number of people who know more about the country programmes than I do. Um, so which, is, which does mean that I might well throw you the ball, Bob, uh, mm -hmm. Janine, uh, Sophie, uh, and others uh, at an appropriate point. I want to start off with Sierra Leone, and this is a historic look backwards to prove my point, and then at the end of this piece of Sophie, if I may, I'm going to just ask you to update where we are, update us where we are currently. Sophie Thomas was the lead on the safety and security element of the particular program that's there now. Um, but this is a historic view, really to prove my case and to ask how this could be. Sierra Leone is a logical starting point, uh, it has been described in various papers as the UK's flagship SSR programme. And we've been working there for about 15 years, and much has been written about it, quite a bit by Lisa Denny, who's not here tonight, but from ODI, and a number of other of you, I know others of you that have worked in, in Sierra Leone. The, the, amount, the, the amount of, uh, uh, of UK spend on security and justice in Sierra Leone is enormous. Uh, for three years following the Africa Conflict Prevention Report, 76% of the Africa Conflict Prevention Report fund went to one country, Sierra Leone. And on top of that, of course, you had a substantial DFID bilateral program, or more correctly, bilateral programs, working on security and justice. A huge international military advisory and training team, IMAT, in place there for something like nine years, and an awful lot of FCO and MOD um, interactions and small programs as well. And the reason I mention all of that is you can begin to see that we put a lot of effort in the UK into working on security and justice in Sierra Leone. And I think the overall did a pretty good job on it. But uh, my problem is the following, is if you look at the substantial sums, massive sums actually, which were spent on the uh, Sierra Leone Armed Forces, the military, they were matched proportionally by the amount of money spent on setting up the Ministry of Defence, staffing the Ministry of Defence, and bringing it up to the required standard in Sierra Leone. So a big tick for accountability and oversight. The trouble was during the same period, and we're talking about a uh, 12 year period here, we spent an equal and probably a larger sum of money on working with the police, with the prison service, with the judiciary, and particularly with the police, we did nothing at all about accountability and oversight. I don't understand that. There has <coughs> been and is not terribly not terribly um, strong, Ministry of Internal Affairs in Sierra Leone during that entire time. And until Sophie's team started work uh, in 2012, uh, not a penny, not a cent, had been spent on supporting the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And the consequences of that are very straightforward. You have a police service which actually has lots of capacity constraints still, but in terms of the West Africa model of policing, is probably one of the better ones. Doesn't mean to say it's perfect, it's far from perfect, but compared to many, it's doing a reasonable job. Yet it was making up its own strategies, its own rules for engagement. Everything that it did, it decided by, by, by quite a strong executive management team within the police what they would do, because they could not and would not receive any guidance at all from the line ministry. Instead, it was received direct, if ever. If at any, they had any influence, it came directly from the presidency. There is a thing called a police council. Uh, in Sierra Leone, but that is, and that indeed has many representatives of the police on it, as well as the Vice Presidency and some other favoured people, which cannot, in my view, be considered to be uh, an oversight agency. So what you've got, a never-increasing professionalised police service, with all the powers and discretion that police service has, a national police service, 
with nothing and no one holding it to account. And time after time, when I collected reviews there from 2005 onwards, I wrote the same half page, which this is highly risky for the UK. You're working with an agency, the police, which always has the likelihood of biting you on the backside with some human rights abuse. Meanwhile, it's being held by some people as an armed force to hold the RSLAF into check. Well, that's not actually the role of the police at all. Uh, and it really concerned me. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say when I did the last review of the ASJP program there now, which Sophie might talk about more about in a minute, they've actually now started to engage with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, not an easy task, and start to address the issue. But I raise this as my sort of fundamental starting point, although I'm nearly at the end of my piece, which is how is it that our flagship SSR program, I don't like the term SSR, I think it's passed by, but if you want to call it our flagship security and justice <coughs> sector as intervention program, can so completely ignore police accountability. They also, of course, ignored accountability from the prison service and the immigration department and the four other departments they're responsible for, simply by not being there. Now, I think there's culpability here. There's culpability uh, of uh, the presidency, because the presidency didn't want it. There's culpability on behalf of funders, because the funders didn't insist on it. And there's culpability on behalf of other government of Sierra Leone institutions didn't want it either, because that was a bit of a power battle. And the good news, I think, now is that there has an engagement has begun. And Sophie, maybe may, may be as well to just ask you for perhaps one minute, one and a half minutes to update us where we are currently, because I think there's good news at the end of the line, something. 